and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a returning good brother to the temple, the madman behind Justice Velocity and Nebula Chaos. Now coming in, now coming into the fray with Toku Legends, a Z, a Zine, a Zine Quest expansion to the to the same polyhedra system. The one and only Clipper Arnold, how are you doing today, man? Great, thanks for having me. Great to be here. Wonderful introduction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for thank you for coming on. Um. I know, I know, Zine Quest has 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 come and gone, but this was something that, given my own background, I I felt I I felt was apropos for me to for me to cover since this isn't even the this isn't even the first um, Toku theme thing I've covered this year. <laughs> no, actually, I was just looking through your channel a little bit, and I didn't realize how tapped in you were to like the Toku world. I had seen, um, I think you had like a Henshin video somewhere i've co i've covered <laughs> i've i did cover um henshin's recent ex recent expansion um okay. i didn't cover the original run of it because of time because of timing and i i've covered three i've covered three minutes from that from that same guy which is bit three minutes is basically his tribute to showa era ultraman and cool. I've had, and of course i've had the magi knights team on several times cool Oh, I do want to clarify real quick. Uh, I, I don't know if you intended it this way, but Zine Quest is still going on, mm -hmm. and um, Toku Legends is still up there as yeah. well uh, until the end of February. So just for the listeners at home. Yeah. Um, but with with you, when it comes to Toku, was your, was your introduction to Toku um, Power Rangers like it was for a lot of folks or was or was it a different introduction um yeah absolutely i was gonna make a joke and be like oh no as a five-year-old i saw the original run of common rider through uh you know smuggled uh bootleg vhs tapes <laughs> but yeah no uh power rangers of course it's mm -hmm. where it all starts of course yeah for i mean for a lot of us here right mm -hmm. and do you, and I'm I'm guessing that it's I'm guessing that at some point you ended up looking at at um, fan subs of the original Super Sentai and Kamen Rider and the like. Yeah, I never got super deep into the Super Sentai stuff. Um, other than uh, there was I think is it called Jet, uh, Chojin Sentai Jetman. I saw a little bit of that one. And I played like the video game for that. That's on the NES. That's still a really great platformer that I replay like every year. Um, but I'm very much into Common Rider. Obviously, loved Power Rangers as a kid, um, and still appreciate parts of it. Uh, and um, I'm really into the original Common Rider manga uh, and the original Super Sentai manga as well. I got those nice, um, like, re-released hardcovers. Uh, that they just put out a few years ago. Those are really cool. Especially the Sentai stuff, because it's like... I don't know, that... Uh, I'm sure you're aware of this, or understand where I'm coming from, but like... Um, obviously, like, American Toku is very different from, like, the source material. But even, like, modern Toku is very different from, like... Um, you know, its roots, and the kind of stuff that they were doing. Like, some stuff is, like... Like, I don't know, even the original Super Sentai manga is, like, it feels more, like, uh... I, I don't want to say, like, edgier. Like, it's clearly still, like, aimed at, like, a younger audience. But, like, there's, like, you know, people getting blown up. And there's, like, more, like, spy antics and stuff like that. And I feel like that's a really interesting angle. Especially from a tabletop perspective that you kind of miss if you're just, um... Uh, you know, if, if we just think of it all as, like, Power Rangers or whatever, right? But... Yeah. Well, both bo both um, Super Sentai and Kamen Rider were were created by the same guy, Shotaro Ishinomori, and 
Yep. I did want to ask if you were familiar, if you were familiar at all with some of the stuff that came that he that preceded that at, that he had done that he had done before, which led to those series. Yeah, I mean, I like Cyborg Zero Zero Nine. Um, there's one. There's one other that that is important to know when it comes to history. Yeah, Skullman. Sorry, I didn't mean to bite off your sentence there, but yeah, Skullman. I've I've looked into that a little bit. Um, haven't read more than a few pages, but I understand the concept, and it is kind of cool. What do you think about it? Um, I. It is cer- the original. The original manga is all right for for what it was trying for what it was trying to do. Um, mm-hmm. I will admit I I enjoyed the um the an- the anime take that Bones had done f- um some years back. Like they did they did a thirteen episode um adaptation of Sk- of Skullman. A lot of people looking at looking at that and thinking, oh, it's going to be like Common Rider. It not ex- not exactly. Skullman is an anti-hero, um, more of more of a mystery affair. Yeah, totally. Um, the and the, it is definitely not a happy story. Um, there there can be an argument made that Skullman is the first anti-hero in comic history. Um. I know some people will say the the Punisher, but I think the Skullman beat beat him by a few years. Um, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't know enough about that to dispute it, but <laughs> Skullman <laughs> came out in 1970. Mm-hmm. And the and the first appearance of the of the Punisher was 1974. So yeah. yeah, he's got he's got him beat he's got him beat by a few years. They didn't do like a Joker focused like one off. There's been uh, preceding that or something like that. Joker has had his own his own comics in in and out in and out over the years, but I remember that. But um, I don't rem- I don't remember that that kind of thing happening in the seventies. Because okay. 70s, that it's that it still be the tail end of the Silver Age, lead, leading into the Bronze Age, mm-hmm. and um, if you know anything about comic history, you know how batshit insane the Silver Age was. Mm-hmm. Like, I I can't for legal reasons I can't say if if people were on drugs or not, but come on. <laughs> Of course, of course, some um, because the and the reason I bring the reason I bring up the Skullman in particular is originally there was or, originally what would become Common Rider was built on um, Toei wanting to do a um, Tokusatsu adaptation of the of the Skullman given the success of um, Super of um, um, Go Ranger the yeah. Super Sentai concept wouldn't be for a few more years. But, oh yeah, sorry. Excuse me. When I was earlier, when I was referring to the original Super Sentai manga, I w- should have clarified I was talking about Go Ranger specifically, so that uh, real Toku heads don't bite my head off. Well, <laughs> yeah, it's a lot. A lot of the earlier Sentai stuff has been has been folded into the Super the Super Sentai label. Um, yeah, I just say it for ease of use but that is an important distinction for sure yeah. uh, I'm a historian so I, <laughs> I go a, a wannabe a wannabe YouTube historian so that kind of thing um, certainly comes up but True. the 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 other but but of course some of course something like the skull man there's no, there's no way you could have done that as a as a to, as a tokusatsu in 1974 and get and get away with it yeah, and I think there were concerns about it uh, being targeted at a younger audience, given like the content of it, right? Yeah, Apparent- apparently, <laughs> the idea of shifting to a more grasshopper-like design was something that Ishinomori- Ishinomori's kid had brought up. Yeah, I've heard that. Like, he showed him like fifty different rough sketches, and he was like, "Oh, I like this one," mm-hmm. and they were like, "That's what we're doing." Yep. Also, and- real quick, I just. Sorry, go ahead. I was just gonna send you something in chat that you might find funny that maybe we can talk about in in a minute. But um, <laughs> um yeah, yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's certainly a thing. History is funny that way, and <laughs> I ha I have. I have co I have covered my fair share of my fair share of stuff. Even even going into the to one of the dark horses when it comes to Super Sentai in the form of Garo. Yeah, I haven't watched Garo yet. I have it like ready to watch, but I haven't quite watched it yet. Um, Garo's had a fair, had a fair few series and and a couple anime though. I all I always felt I always felt like doing Garo in anime form kind of missed the point, since. One of the one of the big selling points it was the fact that the production team behind Garo, the to the Toku version of it, was this who's who of um so of Togusat's pr um creators creators from the nineties. Mm hmm. Yeah, that's cool. I didn't know that because when it com because when it comes to who when it comes to who was who was involved. It was made and directed by Keita Amamiya, who's who has a very distinct st style. He was also he he did a lot of he did a lot of creature designs in the '90s and was the director of two of the better of the two of the two um the two common writer movies during the Dark Age, um, mm -hmm. Zeto and J, and had done had. Had done a lot. Had done a lot of done a lot of monster designs all over the place. Um, as well, the creature design was Yasushi Nirasawa, who's who had done a lot of this, a lot of the designs for Deno, Blade, and Kabuto. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and you know, just just having just having the, having those people involved and. And giving them an, an opportunity to do something with the leash off because it was a it was a late night show. Oh, and every everything just expanded out from there. But with there's a when it comes to doing a Toku RPG, since Toku's a more of a medium than a genre, that's a very that's a very wide net to cast. Is totally. Is it a, is it a case where th where this is this where this is um leaning leaning towards the transforming hero thing so just as much common writer as super sentai? Yeah, I think so. I mean, obviously the it pulls from a lot of different influences, right? Um and some of those are like like cuz toku specifically, I mean, is sort of a flexible term in the first place, right? Cuz it refers to Godzilla technically as much as it refers to um you know super sentai right uh but this is definitely more uh angled towards like squad based superheroes that are inspired by uh, a lot of japanese media um just because i feel like it's tonally very different um in a lot of areas than you know just a conventional like western superhero style you know things are colorful you know transforming heroes tend to be a common thing um i think on the kickstarter i'm sure there's quite a lot of influences listed but personally uh just to like rattle a few off like uh, i know we talked about go ranger um and the original common rider run i've looked into garo and Skullman, and you know as you do when you're making any rpg you need to uh dig into all of the existing media that you can just to wrap your head around it and make sure you're doing it justice but personally i was motivated to do it because um, you know, when I was, ever since probably I was about, like, 15, uh, I found Tokyo Heroes, um, which is a free RPG, uh, made by Ewan Clooney. I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name right. Um, Ewan, I'm, yeah, not, I'm, fam I am very familiar with, um, his, with his work, even back, even back when he w was calling himself Blackbird. Oh, Okay. Yeah, he seems like a cool guy. I think I mean I follow him on Twitter or whatever. Um and I've read through Tokyo Heroes. I never played it, but uh and there's other like um you know, Toku inspired RPGs and stuff, but uh for me there was like a very specific style of Toku game that I've wanted to play for half of my life that I never really got a chance to play. We did do like a one-off kind of uh 
simplified homebrew version of it once when I was like in college, but uh, it was just trying to ca capture like all that stuff that you know lights up your imagination when you're a kid. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like uh, Power Rangers, Sailor Moon. Uh, you know, all those, like, transforming heroes and stuff. And a lot of the influences that are listed on the Kickstarter page are maybe unconventional toku influences. Like, there's, like, Beautiful Joe in there. Uh, TMNT is close enough <laughs> for me to call it uh, an influence. Um, but, yeah, and then, obviously, I love, like, Common Rider stuff um, and everything like that. But, yeah, I don't know where I was going with this in particular, but I guess I'm just saying, like, the game that I was trying to make didn't exist in the way that I wanted it to. And so what do you do when that happens? You make your own, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so we had Nebula Chaos, which is like a sci-fi game. Um, and it was basically, a lot of that was like cross-applicable um, for like sci-fi squad-based heroes. So it was sort of adapting those mechanics um, to make it more like flavorful and particular and stuff like that and well, i've been running sessions of this at the house for the past i don't know like six months or something and it's i run a, a few different games and i'm in a few different like monthly tabletop sessions and without a doubt it's like my personal favorite to write and play and run with just because everything to me and I, at least with the table that we're with it just feels very like explosive and dynamic and you can see it in your mind's eye um, as, like, you know, the toku effects are flashing across the screen and everything like that. And, like, there's one character who has, like, an aluminum bat is, like, his primary thing. And he plays, like, a, he's called Fender Bender. The team is, like, vehicle-inspired. So we, we, we also get a few uh, Justice Velocity mechanics in there, which is fun. But he has this aluminum bat, and it's always, like, he's always doing this cool shit where it's, like, you know, pointing it towards the sun and, like, the camera spins around and then he just mows down, like, a whole uh, line of, like, skull minions or whatever. Or, like, there was one where they they were in a minion lair and the minions were watching a baseball game on, like, a little, like, CRT uh, television set. And then they were just, like, riffing off of that and doing, like, home run stances and stuff. And it's just, like, I don't know. Stuff like that is, like, so fun. Especially, like, at a table, like, having these, like, simple themes, this imagery to play with, uh, it just really, like, makes it pop and makes it easy to, like, you know, get into character, have fun with, and, like, riff on and stuff like that, so. Mm -hmm. I forget the original question. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sure I got a little off base here. Um, but... It is funny you mentioned Beautiful Joe, since I've I've seen a few people misconstruing what the inspiration for that was. Like, I've seen people say, it, say that was his, that was, um, Kamiya's attempt to do Kamen Rider. That was I don't know about that, but that wasn't the inspiration. The inspiration was Zuvat. Okay, I'm unfamiliar with that actually. Um, and if you if I show if I show you what Zu, what um what Zuvat look um looked like, I think you I think you'll um. I think you'll. I think you'll. I think you'll see where. I think you'll. I think you'll see where it. Where the um, thing Kaiketsu Zuvat is. The is the proper name for this for the series. Cool. Oh, uh, that was just an example. Yeah, th this looks sick. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> Oh, I just, like, Google image searched it, too. Does he have, like, a guitar? Yep. That's so sick. This is amazing. Oh. And that, bring, that brings me to to something else. When the, the, even within just, just um, Super Sentai, there's a wide variety of, the, of themes and power sources that are, that are drawn upon, and a lot sure. of, a lot of, um, a lot of games that have t that have tried to tackle Super Sentai have str have struggled with this if they don't if they don't have a particular direction. Uh, so, with with Toku Legends, are would you would you would someone feasibly be able to do magic themed as much as tech themed? I would they be able to do say, um, Maji Ranger just as easily as the, as they could do 
like deck arranger or something like that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's kind of like a funny workaround in that way because um, I don't know if you've seen uh, much of the Nebula Chaos uh, PDF. I should have sent you all this stuff prior. Uh, you, uh, you did. <laughs> oh, I did. Okay, great. Um, well, as, as as far as what you just sent, no, you did. No, you didn't send that. Yeah, so I just sent over the alpha for Toku Legends. So this has all this stand-in art. It doesn't have the mm -hmm. the the final art, but that'll uh, kind of illuminate some of what I'm talking about here. But yeah, with I mean, so in Nebula Chaos, um, right? We have like psionics in there that are essentially like because it's like a sci-fi space opera like uh, sort of game. Mm -hmm. So we have like the psionics in there are like you know. There's uh, terrakinesis, cryokinesis, pyrokinesis, which, you know, um, outside of a sci-fi thing, just mean fireball, ice beam, you know, earth magic. So uh, it's, it's largely transferable, uh, basically because the source material that it's supplementing is transferable, but also in Toku Legends, as you'll see uh, skimming through the alpha, there's a few things... Uh, you know, we, we introduce a lot of other abilities to make it more... Like, so there's a super kick, right? Which is clearly um, a rip-off of the, the rider kick. Uh, and, like, uh, you know, you have more, like, uniquely toku elements in there. So, like, there's um, biofeedback resonance, which um, sort of reflects damage. But that's supposed to, you know, represent some sort of, like, technological capacitor that some toku hero might have or something like that. And, uh, and then... When I saw yep. the biofeedback as, as part of it, the first thing that came to mind was um, Stronger. No, com Common Rider Stronger. Oh, I'm not familiar. He... That was... The, stronger is the writer that Kabuto is a bit of a callback to. Oh, I've seen this guy. Okay. Yeah, I'm not very familiar, but I see what you're talking about. Yeah. And a lot of a lot of his kit was about was about manipulating electricity. Cool. Yeah. So I mean, to answer your question specifically, um, that's like we're kind of lucky that we built Nebula Chaos in such a way that is flexible. Because in that, also the psionics are severable, right? Like if you're playing like a realistic hard sci-fi setting, like um, maybe you don't want game-breaking psionics in the mix um but you know including it as an option means that people can have one or the other or you know both mm. and um you know in in the toku game we kind of get that as an advantage too because uh you can have like a an elemental themed character uh that has like science as an explanation or you can make it a more magical character. I mean, there's also some abilities in here that are direct call-outs to, you know, like uh, Sailor Moon or whatever. Like, there's a moon blast, a heart beam, stuff mm -hmm. like that. Um, so, a lot of effort was made into, like, it's a short zine, right? I mean, theoretically, you could run uh, Toku Legends in Nebula Chaos with maybe only, like, a couple pages of these rules. Um, but this was just to, like, really dial it in and make sure that we're giving people those sort of like exact sort of like game mechanics and elements that really hit on what's great about toku as a genre right um so there's like a couple of other things in here that i just want to mm -hmm. uh kind of point out so like it we tried to do like a mix of um you know more like sci-fi type stuff with sort of uh, more of that like uh I, I, I'm I'm lacking the terms here, but there's sort of like a uniquely not like magic necessarily. I guess there is magic in some of it, but there's there's just a very uniquely like Toku je ne sais quoi that's like hard to articulate, but like you know it when you see it, right? Like so there's a chrono amulet in here, for instance. There's angelic wings, uh there's a phoenix shield, and the shield will like um negate damage and destroy itself or whatever, you know. Um, there's a gravity hammer. There's uh, This one hasn't actually been 
bulked out yet because this is still the alpha or the beta now rather but there's like a heart wand and things like that but yeah i mean to answer your question specifically in regards to the like items and abilities and stuff like that it is made in a way where you're supposed to be able to play any flavor of toku to a certain extent that you want to do so like if you want to fight if you want to be a bunch of like uh transforming heroes who fight like demons you could do that if you want to be biologically engineered super soldiers you can do that uh if you just want to play power rangers you can do that if you want to have a gm and solo player and play you know a solo common rider game or a common rider s game you could do that uh so it is built to be very flexible in that regard and um speaking of common rider uh-huh since since the since the days of R, since the days of rx of Bla- of black rx there's been the motif of utility forms you know f- forms that are not necessarily upgrades but di- sure. uh, different kits that spe- that specialize it's it started sure. with with the robo rider and bio rider in um in in black rx and re- and really expanded outward with the di- with the different um forms that kuga had mm-hmm. you know cuz the each of each of them weren't better or worse, but more but more skewed towards certain um, certain types of encounter, and, so, and right. some of them having significant drawbacks to the point where you couldn't just throw them out when you wanted to, like say Pegasus. Um, mm-hmm. You know, because well, Pegasus is it enhances senses, but you can only take that in, that sensory enhancement for so long. But yeah. It is, um, but if if someone wanted to integrate form sw- form switching when it comes to utility forms, would they do so using the extra abilities, or is there is there a different approach you you think you think might um, better fit? Yeah, so that's an interesting question, and I have thought about this. I will say it isn't particularly integrated or addressed in the zine, uh, but in my mind, the way that it works is. Uh, this will actually probably help me explain a little better if I go into some of the base mechanics real quick that are new in Toku Legends as well Yep. Uh, to explain this. So basically, one of the main things that's different about it from Nebula Chaos is the Henshin format, right? So uh, you, we do address as optional rules, like, you don't have to use them, but most, I mean, most, like, Toku involves this um, sort of transformation, right? So... You, on your character sheet, you have stats for your civilian mode and your henshin mode. Um, and when you transform into henshin mode, you deplete all of your existing energy points and uh, start back at zero. But once you do that, you're able to adopt this more powerful form that has like more abilities and everything like that. Um, and so the, the idea is, from like a tactical and like narrative perspective is it's like oh no these bad guys caught me and i'm still just walking around in my like average civilian form you know like in power rangers when uh they sometimes they'll fight a little bit before they transform right and so maybe uh you're incentivized to you know get some fighting in or use a quick ability or something like that before you transform because once you transform you build up your energy incrementally right so in civilian mode you start at your max ep but once you transform you accrue ep per round or uh round of combat or we call it tense situations right Mm -hmm. so if you're in combat uh and you're in henshin mode for instance right you start at one uh first round of combat it allocates one per turn right so you're beating up these minions trying to take them out as you're building up energy to unleash a powerful attack, right? Um, and that was like another thing that's like unique that we tried to do with this uh, to make it more like Toku inspired. Is like, you know, if you're a if you're a Toku hero, you don't just roll up and unleash your finishing move because you have the energy to do it, right? You're building up to that so that it feels more powerful and explosive when it happens, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so that's sort of how the energy point system works. Uh, and how the um, transformation henshin mode works. Um, so with that said, uh, like I said, I wouldn't necessarily 
we don't necessarily address like the mode switching as much. Uh, I have considered it. The game that we're in right now, that's not really the style of um, like the narrative universe that we're doing. But of course, that's like a common theme in Common Writer. Um, so for people who do want to do that, I would probably say uh, like with the extra abilities or the items, a lot of them are by like GM Fiat, right? So uh, when when our players complete a milestone of some sort. Uh, I'll be like, okay, that was great. You guys completed the mission. Here's three ability points, and you can select a tier four item of your choosing or something to that effect, right? Mm -hmm. And then they look in the book, they do their upgrades, you know, they get their bump in stats or their uh, bump in energy points or they get their, their cool new abilities or something like that. I think that's a good opportunity for that style of play to, like, maybe drop some information like, hey, you're going to be going up against this fire monster next round uh, and then narratively you know you can select an ability that's more like water based for instance right or um, you can get a cartridge that uh, is more water based and you can work that in through the abilities or the items uh, if that's sort of like the narrative style that you want to play and then by the end of it of course you'll have as uh, writers typically do this sort of arsenal right uh, that you can pick and choose to attack enemy weaknesses and fill whatever um, gaps you're trying to fill uh, tactically with that, right? Uh, but you're also limited, you know, by um, earning that equipment uh, as, you know, it would happen in a show like that. And you're also limited by the amount of energy points um, that you use, right? Because most of the time you're going to be fighting little guys or uh, mini bosses trying to build up to those big moments. And so when you do get an opportunity to use a big ability or a big item like that, you need to make it count. And so you need to use something that like is like laser focused and targeted to the weakness of the uh, kaijin or the monster that you're fighting and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. very roundabout way, but I hope that <laughs> addresses your question as well as uh, more more about the system that I think maybe perhaps you didn't know or that uh, the listeners might not be aware of. So yeah. I appreciate the question. I, and I have thought about that, actually. It's uh, not particularly outlined in that way in the zine. But, you know, maybe that is something good to point out. So. And I'm, I'm guessing full-on upgra full um, upgrade forms, like mid-season or late-season upgrades, is, some, is in that same ballpark, for lack of a better term? Yeah. Uh, so, like, the base henshin suit is... Uh, it just gives you one bonus... Uh, damage reduction um and then the uh, the way that we kind of play this right is like like i said a lot of it the uh advancement is by gm fiat and that's because like nebula chaos or injustice velocity it's kind of uh there's this elasticity right between are we running this game as a one shot or are we running it as like a six session campaign or do we want to play an ongoing like 50 session thing or whatever and the big question there is like, when you do get upgrades, right, or the the rather the GM upgrades that are allotted have to be sort of calibrated in a way. So like, if you give your players three AP per session, as I have been doing, and like you know high tier items or mid to high tier items every session after they complete a mission, um, you know that's going to be like probably a six session game before the game breaks <laughs> entirely uh but you know if you're more sparse with it like uh give ap based on um you know big moments like big missions being completed uh you give more items based on that same sort of pace uh, it, it stretches out pretty long like i've played like 60 sessions of one game, one round robin GM game of Justice Velocity, and we upgrade like very sparsely, but it feels more meaningful. And uh, when that happens, because it's it's a little rarer, but it also like lets you run the game pretty indefinitely without uh, uh, things sort of like falling apart on you or whatever. So it's mm -hmm. you know I I typically build Justice Velocity or Nebula Chaos as a uh, oh, you know primarily for like one shots. Or short campaigns, uh, but that's not to say that it can't be done uh, for longer campaigns because I've certainly done that. I, I know other people have certainly done that. Um, but
but I think it's it, it's just a caveat that I like to throw in there uh, that that's what the game is focused on because um, basically like you know if people come into it expecting the laser focused uh, level progression of like D and D fifth edition like sorry we don't do that you know this is more for like uh, it's a more like fast and loose like DIY uh, sort of like system to begin with that really encourages player creation uh, or you know GM creation player ingenuity, uh, hacking the system to fil fit your own purposes, and um, you know making those innovations and steps forward, and making those easy to make too, um, so that you know we can inspire creativity, let people share this like social experience of playing wonderful games with their friends and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but uh, you said mid-season suit upgrades. Yes. Oh yeah. So we in the my home game of this. Uh, they do get their suits stronger and stuff by um, taking like certain upgrades and stuff. Um, usually, like something small, like I'll, I'll let them do like a bonus DR uh, or like some bonus health or like you know get a bonus ability or something like that. Um, that again, one of those things that uh, there's not really like hard and fast rules for it in the zine because we're trying to hit. Uh, a, we're we're trying to pack as much punch into like a small package. Um, but there's definitely certain ways to do that. Um, but yeah, to answer your question, that's not explicitly clarified in the zine. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think I think you can kind of understand where I'm going with that. That that's definitely something that's doable uh, within the confines of the system, of course. Yeah, it's it's just that um, it's it's one of those things that's get, that's going to get brought up and. Now, obvi obviously, there's not a whole lot new that need that needs to be done when it comes to personal vehicles, because well, the, well, through Justice Velocity, the work was already done was already done when it came to that. Uh, yeah, but totally. When it comes to me when it comes to Mecha and in in general and combining Mecha in particular, um, that's one of those things that can that could get a bit could get a bit tricky. How do you plan on tackling that? Yeah, so that one I was actually very scared to run <laughs> the first time we ran it. Um, but it surprisingly turned out like really amazing and was probably one of the best sessions that we had. Um, so in our home game, uh, as I stated previously, they they are like vehicular inspired heroes. So we have Fender Bender, who's like a big, muscly, tanky bruiser. Um, he, his henshin suit kind of looks like uh, like a transformer almost um, like um, he has the torso of like you know a big semi truck with like the exhaust pipes coming out of it or whatever and then uh, we have Asphalt Avenger mm -hmm. who's um, sort of like a, he's he's kind of a cross between like a maybe like a what you might call like a thief like build but also as like a face um, he like wears all black and a scarf and uh you know, black helmet, and uh, he does most of the talking. And then we have Blue Thunder, who's a um, <laughs> he's like a an IT guy by day, and his whole thing is he's really into like helicopters. Because I guess there's this movie called Blue Thunder uh, that my friend Nick, who's running him, is uh, sort of like is riffing on there. So they, you know, they all have the big guy actually has a tiny motorcycle for the visual gag. Uh, Blue Thunder has this like helicopter that's his whole entire life, and that actually got blown up last session. <laughs> and then uh, Asphalt Avenger has like he's like a street racer, um, so he has like a souped up like you know Justice Velocity type of street racing car. Uh, and there's another a couple other characters who just joined recently, but that's sort of like the core group. Um, and in that session where we did the Mecha thing, it was like okay, great, everyone has a vehicle. It's you know going to be Voltron, Power Rangers, whatever. You're all going to come together, um, and the way that we did it actually was uh, so. For those who don't know, in Nebula Chaos, Justice Velocity, and Toku Legends, we do a two action economy system. Uh, you can do any number of actions that enable you to move, make an attack, use an item, use an ability, or whatever. But you can only use an action that deals damage once per turn. So you can move twice, you can you know, use healing items as much as you want, but if you're going to attack, you can only do that once per turn, unless there's like a special ability that lets you attack twice or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. um, 
So the way that we did it in this, there's two different breakdowns uh, suggested in the zine for how to handle mecha combat, but basically they were fighting this uh, kaijin named Axolotl, which is a riff on um, the, the Axolotl uh, animal, but um, he was, you know, like a more humanoid version and he has an axe, so it's like a stupid pun or whatever. Uh, he axes a lot, axolotl. Um, so he, like, you know, grew to monstrous pr proportions, becomes a kaiju. Uh, and what, what do you do except for uh, assemble the giant transforming mech um, that the quest giver just uh, alerted you to is possible, right? Um, and so in that game, we had... Uh, different piloting roles, right? So one person was moving the legs, one person was handling the ranged weaponry, and one person was handling the melee weaponry. Um, and so they had to sort of like work together as a team, make sure they were hitting their piloting checks, and they, you know, they were doing like little stuff in between, right? Like uh, there's an ability called scan, so like one guy was like checking out the stats of a monster while we're like rearing up to do the giant like sword attack and stuff like that. Uh, and it actually worked out like really well um and like i said was like super exciting uh so that's one way to do it is to delineate specific piloting roles uh now when you're in that role and you're only responsible for one specific thing and you can only like use an attack action once like uh generally speaking you know you can come up with creative ways to use your extra action but generally you're kind of focused on doing that one thing to help the team shine and uh make a good tactical decision right mm -hmm. um there was also, like, the guy who's piloting the legs actually failed his last piloting check and, like, fell on the ground prone, and it was, like, a horrifying moment. Um, and then the monster comes and, like, leans over them. They succeed in dodging the attack, and then they do this final, like, blow with, like, this giant sword. It was so fucking cool. That's, like, what I love about playing <laughs> this system and this game specifically. It's, like, so many big moments like that are so fun. Um... And it's, you know, a wonderful synthesis when, uh, you know, player input and the dice and the game come together and everything's firing on all cylinders. Um, but there's also, like, that... For, so for that session, we only had three players, right? So um, it might be a little more complex if you have, like, nine players at the table or whatever. I don't know what you would do with that. Um, well, I guess I do. I guess I'm getting to that. But if you have, like, five up to five players, there's, like, other suggested roles... Uh, that players can adopt in the mecha, right? So um, you can part out control of the head, arms, and legs if you want to, or someone can run comms. Uh, you know, like, it, it, the example it gives in here is, like, you know, warning civilians through the intercom, radioing back to base to, like, transmit information. Uh, there's also, like, a role for computer targeting, uh, which is more, like, intelligence-based, which helps with scanning and navigation. Um, so that's the piloting role version of the giant mecha but there's also an alternative rule that we i have not actually run so but i've uh it's it's included in the book which is like basically the mecha becomes your sole avatar for the party and you're deciding by committee what actions it will take that turn uh which might be better if you have like a huge group and you don't want to keep track of everyone moving every little finger on the giant mech or whatever. Um, but that, I, I mean, the idea there is basically that everyone's controlling this cooperatively together, you know, figuring out what the best course of action is and acting as a team, a cohesive unit to make stuff like that happen. So, um, so yeah, I don't know. And I, obviously that's like, I don't know if people are going to be running giant mechs every session of the game. I mean, I suppose you could, but uh, it's one of those things like Injustice Velocity, right? Um, there's like a race mechanic where it's like full position based racing, right? Which is a little bit of a subsystem to the main rules, but it's supposed to be like, you know, in Fast and Furious, there's always a big cool race at the beginning. Maybe there's one in the middle and in between it's like the uh, cars are doing other things or there's like a short drag race and we include rules for all of that. But that's sort of like a rare thing where in a campaign length uh, thing, you have a position based race like once every few sessions or whatever right to keep it cool and interesting and uh make it a big moment and that's sort of like where the giant mechs are mm -hmm. in this is it's like it's not something that i you know probably not something you're going to be whipping out every session but it does make for a really cool big dramatic moment when it does come out and you know just having that option i think is like really cool so mm -hmm. 
Yeah, oh. I can I can certainly get, I can certainly get that. Now, with that with that in with that in mind, there's there are there are certain drawbacks that sh that that sh that show up that I was a bit I was a bit curious about. I mentioned mm -hmm. I mentioned Garo the big the big thing with the big thing with Garo is when it comes to that transform that transformed armor that they have they can only safely maintain it for 99.9 .9 seconds. Right. Um, or if I or if I have to use another example there's have you have you seen Common Rider Fies? Uh no, I'm I am familiar, but yeah. It's mid-season upgrade was Fies XL which can go which can go at can go at ridiculous high speed um but only for about 10 seconds and then it reverts back to base form. I'm I'm sorry, can you hold that thought for 1 second? I just need to uh go get the door real quick. I'll be right oh. back. Okay. So with those sort of time limit based um based pow based powers or abilities how would you, how would you advise someone to to hand to handle them in Toku Legends? Uh, if it were me running that, what I would do is I would just set uh like a one d four on the table and be like, okay, combat has to be done in like you're henching now. Combat has to be done in four turns, otherwise you know X Y Z happens or something like that. That's my initial instinct mm -hmm. uh, for something like that. Um, or you could, you know, make it a random roll based on how much energy they have to start with. Like, you know, roll a d6 plus your energy, something like that. I think would probably be the solution. Mm. But oh, now give, given the way given the way energy um, accumulates the the way it does, um, ha is the how do you hand how do you handle the risk of people? Um, Play, playing, playing, def playing defensive for long, for long stretches of time. What's known in the fighting game community as turtling. Turtling. <laughs> uh, you know, it's funny that never has come up in any tabletop game I think I've ever played in my life. Uh, I mean, there's one time where there's like a druid who wants to go inspect like the mushrooms or something instead of like engaging in the combat that's unfolding before their very eyes but i don't know personally i've never really run into that actually um yeah, yes inspect the mushrooms <laughs> um i mean i guess the only disadvantage to that would be you know that uh if you're just defending right um you're opening up yourself or your teammates or your civilians to uh danger right w which is bad so, um, but yeah, theoretically, I mean, there's definitely some rules in here that can be super exploited, um, which sometimes I like to do in PvP combat, just sort of stress test the system. Uh, like, like I said, I mean, it's it's these games are meant to be played uh, with your friends uh, to create a cool narrative and story, right? Um, but uh, if it were in like a PvP setting, like you could definitely do some weird like Yu-Gi-Oh combo shit with some of the stuff in here especially with the <laughs> the energy system like there's a few things in here that let you like uh generate energy reallocated across your team stuff like that um and it's kind of cool because uh like obviously it has that toku feel of like building up energy to unleash powerful attacks but it also almost feels like a you know like a like a tcg or like a deck building game where it's like you're incrementally building and like that's another factor to keep control of uh how you like use that um you know how it grows how much you spend into it and stuff like that so it's kind of fun i mean i i like that aspect of it but um i should say also i'm real quick before we move on as well um like one of the things that i did want to point out that is an optional component is like uh, this thing called squad points and abilities, mm -hmm. uh, w which is like per session, it starts at zero, and you gain squad points by uh, assisting other player characters, participating in a combined effort, saving civilians, basically doing things to mechanically incentivize people playing nice, being a good team, uh, working together, firing on all cylinders, etc. Uh, but then you lose points by you know friendly fire. You know, if civilians get blown up, 
or if a character dies or whatever. Um, and it's uh, like the chaos token or like the um, uh, what is it in Justice Velocity? I should know how my own games work, but whatever the equivalent, high octane mode. Uh, it's a use it or lose it thing. So you um, with squad points, it only happens that session. You're building up. So it, while you're building up energy points in combat, you're also building up squad points throughout the whole session uh, that can be used for powerful finishing moves, team attacks, uh, you know, stuff that, like, there's one called emergency extraction, which lets you, like, immediately extract the teammate from, like, a dangerous situation, like if a flaming building is about to collapse on them or stuff like that. Um, so, I mean, that component of it is kind of cool, too. It is a lot gamier, maybe. Like, I, I don't know if I would recommend this for someone who's, like, maybe brand new to tabletop RPGs, because there are a couple different, like, uh, systems to keep track of. Um, but f if, if you do have people that are into the more... Um, that that component of the game, it feels really satisfying, especially as a Toku game, because everything kind of, like, builds together so that those big moments happen uh, at, like, when they're supposed to, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and you have, like, a lot of different options... Um, as a team than uh, you might have as an individual, right? And it's kind of, those are reflected throughout the mechanics of like energy points, squad points and stuff like that. And um, that's kind of like one, one of the unique reasons I wanted to make this game was like it, um, a lot of the other Toku games that I've seen are more like narrative games, right? Like, uh, you know, like Henshin is a diceless RPG or whatever. This is like uh, a lot more, I guess, for those who know what I'm talking about, it's a lot more simulationist or like perhaps traditional. Like you're taking on a role, uh, you're a guy, you have your combat abilities, you're responsible for like doing what your guy wants to do, etc. You know, I and, would hesitate to call either Nebula Chaos, Justice Velocity, or Toku Legends um, simulationist. I just mean as opposed to like narrativist. I it's... mean, also, it's kind of a arbitrary distinction yeah. but you know well i i have i have some i have some issues with G, with gns theory which is which is a whole other rabbit hole sure. i won't get into here yeah we all do <laughs> but i just mean in terms of like uh it's not so much about collective scene building and passing narrative control as much as it's about uh you know inhabiting a character and their actions Gameist, in this I, yeah, say, sure. If I'm gonna use GNS theory, gameist is where I see I see most of, most of the games in in the polyhedra family falling into. They're very gamey, very um, video gamey too. I would say. Which I know I know some people would turn up their would turn up their nose at that. And no, I'm like, um, have fun, have fun in that have fun in that ivory tower. Um, I'll, <laughs> I'll be here. I'll be here actually having actually having fun. Sure. You know, because the the same people who would turn up their nose at that are the people who, um, who are ag aghast at the idea of not, of not having me track every single, bu every single bullet. Yeah, I don't track bullets though. I think that's a little. <laughs> I mean, the, mo the most that I've ever done is is do the thing of, you have infinite ammo, but you don't have an infinite clip. Um, kind kind of a uh, kind of approach. Um. I only re I only really track bullets if I'm doing outright survival horror, and I've made it clear that I'm doing that. Yeah, same actually. Like we did a post-apocalyptic game where it's like, oh, ammo is scarce, so if you shoot a gun, you only have six bullets, and that was like over the course of like eight sessions, right? So it's like, yeah, it's really important. But when you have like when I'm shoot when I'm a, like a ranger, right, and I have like thirty arrows, I'm not gonna role play me running out and retrieving all those arrows and keeping track. Just personally, I know other people have certain preferences, which is totally fine, but uh, th th that component is just not a thing that, like, excites me about tabletop games in particular, is ammo tracking. But, mm -hmm. I, you know, people have preferences. Yeah. Did you... Uh, sorry, go ahead. It's a free country and, pe and people are free to be wrong. I will. I will <laughs> note when you when you said that you're not doing the level thing, I w I was tempted to jump in and, si and say, 
if you if you want that kind of thing, the Power Rangers RPG is, is that way. God help. Oh, you. okay. Yeah. Because <laughs> I'd say I of the of the attempts at doing Toku in tabletop form, I think the the official Power Rangers RPG is probably the worst I've seen. I you know I haven't really looked into it. Um, they made Ranger it... colors as classes. That's a little silly. Not not <laughs> only. And not only that, they ha they had they they talk it talked about how you could use it to run any kind of Power Rangers campaign, but so much of the design skews towards season one Mighty Morphin. Sure. Like having yeah. they they designed say the for example the blue as as if they're meant to be the smart Tech guy. guy. Yeah. Except you look at the history of both Power Rangers and Super Sentai that doesn't really pan out no i mean that's generally speaking sometimes what they do but it definitely changes depending on you know the season and oh. what's going on but same same thing applies with say ha they have the green as the loner when you look at a lot of green rangers over the years and they're oftentimes the weirdo not the loner yeah and like red as the leader, right, et cetera. Red, be red being the leader, that's a that's always be that's always been a thing. But the relationship between red and blue is usually a nod to the story of the red and blue oni. That's interesting. I didn't know that. I mean, I'm f I'm familiar with the the story of the oni, but I that's I I never really heard it put that way. That's very interesting. Uh, some some sometimes more than others. Um, having the the like the idea of having um they having those having those sort of th th those sort of things as well as having white being the equivalent of a prestige class what was um was a questionable move and i know i know some might say that the, that they may be planning to addr to address later seasons in ex in expansions the thing's been out for for a couple, for a few years now um so f so far the the only expansion they did was that crossover thing between the other um the the other G the GI Joe and Transformers R RPGs where you could cross between them which I don't think anyone was asking for that. Um, no, that's a little silly. But I mean the there's also the red being the leader that that wasn't the problem with that particular archetype. The problem that I did have was a skewing towards a melee weapon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I mean, generally with all of this, right, like, you're familiar with polyhedra core systems, and, like, mm -hmm. I think that's, it's weird because doing less gives people more freedom sometimes in, like, game design. Uh, like, so, right, it's a classless, level-less system. The idea is, like, I don't like being told that, like, you know, oh, I have to be an orc if I'm playing Shadowrun and I want to be a big beefy guy because that's what will give me the best stat, stat advantage, even if I just want to be a cool, like, chromed out, like, human or whatever, you know? Like, I don't, I don't like being p pigeonholed into, like, you have to run this in this way because it's the most optimal and this is, like, what's expected and this is how everyone else is playing this game. Like, all of our games are built in a way that are meant to encourage like player and GM creativity more so than like anything else. Mm. And so like I think, you know, having a classless system, it's like, yeah, sometimes you get weird, goofy stuff cobbled together that maybe wouldn't make sense. But like the player is making that decision on how they want to build their character and what they see their character being in their own like mind's eye. You know? And whereas like, you know, um, being a specific color ranger that determining your class is like i don't know that's i mean and that's something that's easy to reskin to like you know i you could be a leader or a tech guy and wear a different color uniform or whatever but i think the the idea there is as a mechanical design like this is how the game is written this is how it's supposed to be played like that doesn't mesh well with like you can play any season of Power Rangers or Super Sentai with this. Like, that doesn't really check out, right? So, um, I mean, not to blast my own horn here or whatever, but I, that is what I personally like this about is your, our system. This is your interview. You should be able to blast your own damn horn. 
Okay, fair enough. But that, I mean, that is what I love is because I, I design games how I would want them to exist as a player, right? And, like, that's one of those things that's really important to me is, like, uh, player autonomy and, like, character creation and building whatever type of character you want. And, like, you know, the guys said that they wanted to run, that, you know, they wanted their suits to be... Uh, you know vehicular inspired right i'm like sure why not or they're like i want to be this kind of character but i also want to dabble in having this ability and i'm like sure why not like i think asphalt avenger has like the spikes ability from uh nebula chaos now which is like that ability is meant to be for an alien creature who like shoots spikes out like instinctively when they're like close to an enemy uh, but when he's wearing it, you know, it's like more like, oh, I just have spikes on my jacket now that as like a cool like sci-fi superhero, I can like shoot out as like a thing, you know, and that's like something that I didn't like, you know, if I was a more strict GM, I would be like, oh, no, you can't have spikes that doesn't match with your character concept or whatever. But he took it and it, you know, it works. It makes I, sense. You, it's cool. You know, so something I, something I will sometimes I will I will compromise with with my players or get or show or show an alternative way to the same um the same conclusion but yeah. another t but a lot of times i will tell them make it make sense yeah like if, i if, think sure if, if in that kind of situation if somebody had presented to me the whole using spikes thing i would have said oh, okay how okay how is he sh how is he where how is he shooting spikes where is it where is it coming from what's the catch um and ha you know that's that sort of have them th have them think about it so it's not just th it's not just thrown in there uh, willy-nilly um yeah i'm totally about that like letting the i think narrative first is like mainly what we're getting at right mm -hmm. like uh and th but that's definitely something that's like uh i'm not saying an afterthought but just having more at your disposal rather than less i feel like is really empowering as a player and if there's easy ways to make it make narrative sense, right? So, yeah. The there is there is one motif that's been around in Super, in Super Sentai for the longest time, and in, in fact, I'd say since since almost since day one, even if some of some forms of it got a little bit silly. And that is the all that is the all team attack, whether it be. The, whether it be the football all the way back in Go, all the way back in Go Ranger, or the combined weapons that you that you would see um, down the road, or even just sh even just everybody shooting their lasers at one spot, um, this is this that kind of thing has been a motif for the longest time. Mm -hmm. uh, or e how would you handle that kind of thing in Toku Legends? Yeah, I'm glad you asked. This is a great question. So there's a uh, there's a squad ability called Ultimate Team Attack. And there are different levels to this, but this is the highest cost squad ability that you can use. It costs 10 squad points, uh, which, as I mentioned before, you're building up squad points over the duration of a session. You use them or lose them. It only lasts for that session. And we they don't do the Ultimate Team Attack every session. Sometimes they got guys falling left and right, and they need to use Dynamic Resurgence, which is a four squad point thing. Uh, but there's like... Anyway, ultimate team attack. Uh, the rules as written says, the team does a powerful attack. Have one player make one attack on a single foe with a plus two to hit. If successful, all players within attack range roll for damage and double it. This attack costs one action per player. Um, so basically, they're getting a free attack, doubling damage, and getting a, an advantage to hit. And it's literally, it's supposed to symbolize that, like, you know, all of their weapons come together into this, like, cool giant gun that fires at like this one specific enemy or like you know they just like backflip into a specific formation and then shoot out in all directions or whatever mm -hmm. that's what it's supposed to be there's also uh on the squad abilities chart finishing moves um there's like a vanguard formation which gives you a defensive bonus for like assuming a specific formation uh there's team shield uh, which protects the team in combat. Uh, there's team attack, which is a different sort of rung of the ultimate team attack, which is like um, all players that are in attack range basically uh, get an attack that is still a costed action, but they get a little bit of a bonus damage to it. Um, there's one called cooperative assault, which is uh, where like two 
players team up to make an attack. You know, stuff like that. So that's definitely like... Uh, I didn't, have you played Chroma Squad? Yeah, it's been a while since I did, but I ha- but I have played it. Yeah, so that was, I mean, definitely one of the influences as well was like, you know, it's a it's a strategy RPG that's like Toku inspired, and I feel like they really did this well. Was like chaining squad abilities in a similar fashion to have it have like this really cool uh, impact, both like visually but also like mechanically. Um, and so that was sort of like a part of the inspiration behind a lot of these squad abilities was like that kind of that kind of game design um, idea, like weaving that into the tabletop universe. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I can I can get I can um, get that now. When it the tr- the tricky thing when it comes to classless and levelless affairs is figuring figuring out how to make sure that mo- that the op- the opposition is not is not too ov- not too overwhelming because you know the last thing anyone wants is a, t- is a TPK. I know some people romanticize the TPKs that they have, but <laughs> no. Yeah. <laughs> There's a there's a reason people are hesitant to play Tomb of Horrors. Even even the most hardest of hardcore old school people don't want to touch it. Despite what despite their claims uh, despite their claims otherwise. Sure. But with but um how but when it comes to making um the kaijins, do you do you have a tier set up so so that this is for a baseline of of mooks? Um, monsters of the week generals and the final and the final boss yeah so um basically uh generally speaking to address this question as well is like um as things are in the polyhedra core system we really are about personally i'm like very into the idea of trusting and not underestimating the creativity and um ingenuity of gms and players um so like a lot of these things you know are kind of like uh you know allocating ap properly you know like calibrating um you know enemy encounters like stuff like that there's just a lot of trust put into uh the people who are in charge of running their adventure to make sure that it's balanced in terms of like what they're trying to achieve right so like there's different options for player death in nebula chaos because Some people play it a different way, and some people like a challenge, some people don't want their precious characters to ever die. Like, both of those are very understandable, right? And it depends on what your table is like, what your players are like, what they want to get out of the game. And I don't think that that's something that one specific mechanic is the right answer to, as much as giving a couple of options and then letting uh, the GM and the players make the final choice, right? Mm -hmm. Um, That being said, there are not... um, what would be called what are they called challenge ratings in D D? yeah which right? i've never been a fan of for various reasons no right and th- that also like one it's math i'm not like whipping out the calculator while <laughs> like putting stuff together it's not intuitive and it's like also it doesn't take into account a lot of those intangibles of uh you know like tactical circumstances environment like you know what other stuff your players are working with, etc. It also relies on um, the assumption of ha- of having a balanced party of four, which there's no you have no way of no you with to- with Toku Legends or any of the other Polyhedra games have no way of knowing how many people are going to be playing at a give at a given table because you're not there. Correct, absolutely. That's another thing too. Like with the squad points, it it works well uh, for like uh you know the squad point economy works well for you know like three to five players or whatever but you might need to adjust it accordingly you know um that's why it's an optional rule and not something that necessarily will work every time but i mean that's where it shines right so um you might find the need to adjust some stuff like that and with enemies like honestly it's really funny we've been really close to a tpk uh on more than one occasion in this game um Partially because of um, how I'm prepping the adventures, but also partially because the players that I'm playing with can handle it and like like the challenge and like get excited by it. Um, but yeah, there are like different. Oh. 
different Hold on. It's like pretty low level stats, um pretty low level damage output. Um but the idea with those guys is like, you know, you throw them into any encounter, really, and it's just something that the players have to contend with. If there's a lot of hordes, it's scary though because you're risking several attacks from you know five different individuals or whatever but um but yeah i mean there's there's uh small hordes and then there's a trained horde and there's an elite horde and then there's also um this isn't included in the alpha yet but there's like uh basically more autonomous like minions who are like you know uh, not only like mini bosses who are their own entities or whatever but also like these like more elite skull minions or whatever uh, you might want to call it, and like the fr they had been chopping through these like small hordes of skull minions, like it was nothing for like sessions on sessions, and then we had like other enemies too, obviously like mini bosses and robot spiders and stuff like that. But like when I threw like actual enemies at them, that are like enemies that you would have in Justice Velocity or Nebula Chaos, like stuff that's like basically a small group that's slightly less on par with you know the player um the the player level or whatever you want to call it like they were like oh shit <laughs> like this is like a problem you know like we can't just like chomp through these guys like it's nothing you know and then they had to like adjust their tactics because they were going up like a more against a more formidable adversary that was a really fun session too mm -hmm. they were flying to uh Reykjavik uh to uh take on this evil um AI that like lived inside of a volcano yeah. and was trading in cryptocurrency and you know doing all this stuff uh but they were like meeting with an informant at like uh uh you know like this bar in Reykjavik or whatever when these skull minions popped up and shot through the windows and it was it was pretty brutal um but you know the players are tough uh and a few of them go down every now and then but they get back up with a a, a cracked helmet or whatever you know mm -hmm. so which, it's part of the fun. <laughs> one now one of one of the things that's been a that's that's been a bit a bit a bit of a tradition in in various forms has been the transforming weapon. You know, a particular character having a weapon that is essentially a melee weapon that can tr that can pull double duty as a firearm. Um, is that something that would be easy to implement within this setup? Uh, yeah, I mean, well, it's, that doesn't exist in the zine as it is. Um, but yeah, if you want a Final Fantasy VIII Gunblade, um, I don't see why you couldn't do that. Like, you could take, like, uh, the sword stats and, you know, add a blaster to it, and then you just have two in one or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, it might be, I mean, if you want it to be a little bit more mechanically dynamic, there, you might need to do some dialing in. But that's my initial impulse, is just combine those two weapons into, like, one stat block or whatever, you know? Mm -hmm. With the option to use it as either form. Yeah, I can, I can certainly get that. Now, what would you be shooting for as far as a release window for this zine? Uh, it's slated for July, I believe. Um, let me double check that. Yeah, July 2024. So most of the alpha is in pretty good shape. It still needs to be polished off. Um, and then we'll... I, I have a friend who I actually met with today who's doing the layout. Um, and, you know, all things going well. I mean, it's already funded, so it's definitely going to exist. We're just ambling along towards some stretch goals, which would be really nice to hit. Uh, so, for instance, uh, we're just shy of getting free stickers with all the printed physical zines. Uh, there's a tier for bonus art. There's a digital comic uh, that could potentially exist. Uh, so Corey Lewis, who's the uh, the artist on this project, who's an amazing comic book artist. If you're not familiar with Corey Lewis, he's like one of the greatest to ever do it, especially in this style. He just has this very wacky, funky uh, sort of vibe that like works really well. Um, and he's an amazing artist. It was it was really amazing to even get an opportunity to work with him on this, which is really cool. Uh, but yeah, to answer your question, um, July. Uh, and that should line up pretty well with our production schedule. I mean, we got to leave a little bit of time 
uh, in the next like month or two to finalize things and then get proofs and then uh, do some fulfillment. But you know, th that's what's kind of fun about these smaller zines is um, it's not a uh, big um, sort of leviathan to contend with in terms of like laying out an entire book, getting art for an entire book, um, you know, proofing uh, a bunch of copies through <coughs> the printer and everything like that. So it, it really gives you a chance to do something cool, pack a lot of punch into a tight space. And, uh, you know, just make something fun and cool that people enjoy, mm -hmm. uh, which is, you know, what we're trying to do here. So, Yeah, I, I can get that. And I'll, I'll certainly be keeping an eye out for how it develops. But with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to the temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. Absolutely. Anytime. It's always a pleasure. I love... You know, being on the show, I love. Also, I love just like hanging out and shooting the shit with you before or after too, and we get to talk about a bunch of things like the OSR and stuff like that. So, I mean, literally anytime. Uh, I, and thank you again for having us on. It's really great to have, you know, people in the tabletop RPG space who are so like passionate and welcoming and accommodating and willing to like put out, uh, you know, cool stuff about, uh the stuff that other people are making you know that's a very vital role and i, I want to thank you for doing that uh, not just for us but for all the work you do i mean you were telling me that um you hit your uh 10 year milestone right I for i will in a few months okay there you go um but i really appreciate it personally and i'm, I'm sure everyone who's been on your show really does and we appreciate what you're what you do for the community and you know giving us the space to talk about ourselves and our projects and uh, what we're putting out and talking about this thing that we all love, which is tabletop RPGs. So, mm -hmm. And, of, co of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, Stay fucking frosty, everybody. Thank you.